It's the Novice Body Filler episode, part three. And we'll get to that in a second, but I thought first I'd give you a poke, make sure that motivation levels are where they should be, because I suppose in the face of a few setbacks in the last while, mine haven't been great, but we've got some big news. I am preparing the Esprit for a move because we have a new premises for the restoration. The guys at Delta Auto Body have offered me the mezzanine level in the body shop. It couldn't get any better than that. So they are becoming a sponsor very, very soon. As soon as I can get back there and clear a space, make the space workable, I already have a forklift lined up to get her up onto the mezzanine and that is happening. So I just thought I'd say, whatever it is, the money, the time, the space, you know this. They are speed bumps. If you want it bad enough, you will overcome them and do it. Okay, before we see the Cortina, to keep soup going, please like, subscribe and share. Do it now while it's fresh in the mind. Here is the Cortina, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we left it last time in Dolphin Glaze and we're gonna get straight into sanding this back. But the first thing we're gonna do is put a layer of guide coat over this Dolphin Glaze. And guide coat, it's just a fine layer of a spray or a powder that gets into all the little nooks and crannies so that you can easily see whether you've missed any sections, whether you've missed a low point when you're sanding. Now the stuff that the guys gave me first was this, it's like a massive powder puff. I'd never seen anything like this before. It's kind of like the old toner ink that would come out of old printers if you played with them. It's that kind of fine powder. And you just rub it on. And like I say, you know exactly how far down you have to go when you're sanding. Okay, again, working from the outside in, we just sand this back until the guide coat has all disappeared. And we're feeling as ever all the time as we go. Now, somebody suggested better to feel with the palm of your hand rather than your fingertips. I have not been able to talk to the guys to confirm or deny that. It sounds like it might make sense. It sounds like it might be something that would be a preference. I don't know, but we'll figure that out another time because I am going to sit down with Gar at some point and go through some of this stuff and just get more in-depth explanations from a professional body work and spray guy. So you can kind of see with this sanded just how fine the dolphin glaze is. It's just such a beautiful, smooth finish it leaves. And arising from the last couple of episodes, there are some questions that need to be answered. And here's the first thing. Somebody asked, what do you do with something like this grill section here? Well, the bad news is, is you do it by hand. The initial work I did to strip the paint, the old paint off it, I did with the knotted wire wheel on the grinder, but everything since then has been by hand. So each one of these grooves has been prepared by hand numerous times, and you'll see that later on. Now moving over to the near side of the scuttle, you can see there's a little blemish here. There's a little divot that is deeper than everything else. And the only thing for this is to sand down until we get to the bottom of it, literally. So you can see what I'm doing here is I'm working across the panel so that we are sanding evenly and we're not going to create a ripple across the panel. And it doesn't take long to get down through it. So same deal, offside, top of the windscreen, little bit of guide coat and then sand back until we're perfectly smooth. So now the job in depth and here are those grills again. This is the point where I'm pulling the original paint out with the knotted wire wheel. Now, it's time to learn a little bit about masking. And what Gar is gonna show us here is a trick they use to make sure they don't have a hard edge at the edge of a newly sprayed section of bodywork. And what he's doing is he's folding over a small section of the masking tape. And then he puts it across his knee and draws it along to get a longer piece of tape with a fold in it like this. And what happens is, with the car fully masked, as he sprays this panel, the spray will be able to get under this fold, but in a feathered way, it won't create a hard edge, like it would if he applied just a straight piece of tape to this edge. Because this is in preparation to prime the car, not to paint it. And we don't need to put primer across the whole roof. We only need to prime it locally to the work area where there is the possibility of inconsistency in the depth of the paint. 
the primer will build up and create a uniform surface. Now, with some basic masking done, it's time to clean the car. And remember, there's days and days worth of dust here. So the air gun comes out and we start blowing it back. And we remove all the tape because again, it's a harbor for all of that dust. Now, it's easy to start thinking about paintwork, bodywork, filler work, all this stuff, and start feeling like it's a dark art. Well, if there is one part that is dark art and can only be achieved through years of experience, it's mixing paint by eye, which Gar did because when this car was painted, paint was a very different thing. All car paints are water-based now. Whereas before they were cellulose or God knows what, I don't even know. So when Gar went looking up on the computer for a mix for this paint, there is nothing that compares. It, you know, he can find the paint color, but it doesn't relate to water-based paints. So he chose to do it by eye. And he mixed up a batch, just using his wilds and experience. And his first attempt was just a little dark. Now we're drying this with a heat gun, but you see it here sped up. And the second attempt was very close. And you might think, well, looks pretty good to me. It's just slightly green. It's very difficult for me to grade this properly so that you can see it, but it is slightly green. Don't mind the fact that it's more shiny than what's around it. You can still kind of see a very, very light difference. Now, as the phrase goes, a galloping horse wouldn't notice it, but Gar is a bit of a perfectionist and he wanted to go back and tweak this a little more. In the meantime, he showed me a trick for masking up a bonnet. So what we don't want to do is spray the bonnet here, but we do want to spray kind of down over the edge of the scuttle. So the first thing you do is apply tape to the panel to create the edge of the spray job you want. And here's the clever thing. What he's doing here is applying tape to the edge of the scuttle, but leaving some sticking up. And when he closes the bonnet, he offers tape up to the sticky side of the first piece and then pulls it back onto the bonnet. And this makes a seal. This means that no overspray is going to go into any unwanted areas underneath the bonnet. This is one of those clever things, you know. We can go to the moon and all that kind of stuff, but sometimes these little things, these little workarounds that we come up with. Yeah, I'm patting the human race in the back here. I just really kind of lovely to know. Now look at the speed and ease with which he can do this. This would literally take me probably an hour he's gonna knock it out in just a couple of minutes and the reason why he's doing it by the way was pretty much because we are now way over time as in it's late in the evening and we all want to go home and the guys knew if i was left to my own devices here this was going to take hours literally hours Now, this plastic is statically charged. You can get this from any decent paint supplier or decent motor factors even, and it's not particularly dear. You get a big roll in a box, and it's statically charged, like I say, so that when it meets the body of the car, it clings to it like cling film. You want to get this as tight as possible. You don't want to have big flappy bits hanging around because they will flap and they will cause you problems with your paint job. So you saw, we back taped the windscreen here and Gar is literally just using a blade to cut around all of our masked areas and then we'll link this plastic to those areas with some more tape. And it should start to make sense now when you see the way he's cutting. So he'll leave the plastic on the roof and on the windows of the car, but he's going to expose the area up above the windshield and all the way around the scuttle, but literally the rest of the car will be protected from the paint. So you see here, he's taping down all of this plastic. And it's literally there just to mask the car off to protect it. We're only going to get paint where we want it. Another point of note, just this area around the sunroof. The rubber seal, you see we've masked it right up against the roof. You don't want the masking tape to actually 
curve onto the roof you just want it to meet the roof and the reason is again if there is an edge of masking tape anywhere that the paint can build up against an edge it will and you don't want any little steps in paint or little lips forming where they shouldn't be now the trick when you want to mask tight up to an edge and that edge runs around the curve is keep the length of masking tape you have off the roll short so you're keeping the roll close to where you're working and you can kind of steer it with the roll and the trick that you saw Gar use with the folded piece of masking across his knee as he draws the masking tape across his knee he is steering the fold with the roll of masking tape as in if he turns the roll one way it may make that fold reach across the masking tape make it deeper if he turns it the other way it may make it run out and run off the edge of the masking tape so the masking tape is just flat again so with the car all masked up the first thing we hit it with is etch primer and i learned something about etch primer true acid etch primer doesn't last it has a working life of about five days so you mix it it happens in mixes you can use that mix up to five days and at that point you'd need to mix a fresh batch and as gar told me that means that you see a can of etch primer on the shelf in a shop a rattle can it's not true etch primer he says that the paint suppliers will tell you it is but it can't be because true etch primer won't last doesn't keep anyway what etch primer does is it literally etches into bare metal it chemically etches itself into the metal now the problem with that is it can react with overcoats of paint top coats of paint and lacquer and stuff like that so that's why you use etch first to cover any bare metal and that's why you'll see he's literally only hitting areas with bare metal in it then you prime the car with more conventional primer and this primer i'll be very clear on this is another piece of the puzzle when it comes to getting this panel perfectly flat and something i never knew is when you see orange peel in a car now the guys didn't tell me this so slap my wrist if i'm wrong but when you see orange peel in a car it's because the primer stage of the paint job wasn't flattened back i thought orange peel happened in the top coat in the clear coat but if this job is anything to go by the clear coat on the car doesn't produce orange peel but i'm getting ahead of myself and what's happening here is with time in between for it to dry, Gar is giving this car three coats of primer. And the object there is to build a nice thick layer of it on because we are going to sand it back. We're going to flat it, as they say. The guys gave me a bit of stick for this corner here just because it's got a bit of a wobble in it, but it's smooth and that's the main thing, which means that the window rubber will seal against it. So here's an interesting little thing. These little tubs that the paint is delivered to the air gun in, they've got this fine gauze in them, it's called a strainer, and this is just to catch any little bit, as Gar was telling me, you know, there can be hardened little pieces of paint or dust or hair or anything that is airborne can get into the paint when you're mixing it, and these strainers just stop it from going through the gun, because there'd be nothing worse than actually spraying dirt into your paint job. Now, I was amazed at how short a time there was between Gar spraying the primer and when he came along with just an ordinary tin of black paint, cheap tin of black paint that he sprayed from a height. You see the distance he has the spray can away from the work area and he's just dusting it to give it a guide coat. This is the more economical, more accessible way that you or I could get a guide coat onto a piece that we're working on. So with that done, we stripped off all of the old masking tape and then again I remasked all the way around the work area just to protect the panels. Now the guys said work from the outside in as always. Get all of the little detail bits and edges done first and then work the larger portions of the panel with a block. Now what we're using here is 320 grit and you'll see the mottled effect 
of the orange peel as I start into this. It'll be highlighted by the fact that I'm sanding. And this to me now is incredibly smooth, but we hit it with a second guide coat. And now we're gonna go over it with 500 grit paper. And Gar brought out the sander, but you'll notice this time it has a soft pad on it, which means that it will be very difficult to lean too hard. And also that it'll be more sympathetic to a curved panel like this. But we're being very careful here not to lean on it in any one place too much and to progressively sand the panel evenly. Like Gar was saying, you could spray over 320, but to do a nice job, the 500 is the way to go. So I went around the whole work area again with 500, but as I did and I came back around across the grill, across the middle section of Scuttle, I exposed bare metal and my heart sank because I just thought, oh, I've destroyed days of work here. But to my relief, the guy said to me, you know, if you don't expose metal on a job like this when you get to this stage, you probably haven't sanded enough. And they assured me that it would be fine. Now we'll tackle those bare metal bits a little bit later on, but I moved onto the roof and with that 500 grit on the sander with the soft pad, I went across the whole roof and this is just to key it up for the paint that it's gonna receive. All right, so with all that done, we're now ready to start cleaning the car very, very well to mask it up for its paint. And what Gar did at this point was he polished a section on the rear quarter because that was going to give him the best reference as he mixed the final version of the paint. Now, another word on this masking, you'll see there's some kind of light gray masking tape underneath the yellow on the rubber of the rear screen. Well, this is called fine line tape it's very thin tape. It has just some given it and some stretch, which means that it will create a very fine line, but it's also much happier about taping around a curve. So I just used this on the window rubber to get right up against the metal, and then I was able to go over it with the more conventional masking tape. For the final mask up job with the plastic, Tina goes into the spray booth, and here's Gar doing his own preparation, which I told him I'd already done. He's telling me in very polite language that the car isn't properly masked. If I remember rightly, the words he used were something along the lines of, I'm sorry, old chap, but this car hasn't been properly prepared. He's very polite, Gar. So we both set to work masking it up. Didn't I tell you? You mask, you take it off, you mask, you take it off, you mask, you take it off, and then you mask some more. This is exactly the same drill as the last time. And I think both Gar and I were equally happy that he was doing this because for his own peace of mind when he goes to spray the car, there's going to be no surprises. And of course, for my part, this is going to be a better job than I would have done purely because I don't know what I'm doing. I think by now you've probably got a great sense of just the amount of work that a professional will do on a car to really do a good job. We've all gone looking at one point or another for a cheap spray job or we've talked about, oh, you got that spray job done for 1,500 quid. Well, in hindsight now, any time I've ever heard something like that, if it wasn't thousands and thousands of euros, it can't have been much of a job unless somebody was getting a hell of a favor because the conscientious way of doing this means there is no way of avoiding a hell of a lot of work. So respect your local spray guy. Now, he's going over this whole thing with panel wipe. This is a solvent that will just clean any dirt, debris, or anything like that, any grease mainly, off the bodywork of the car so that we have no issues with contamination or any kind of a reaction in the paint when it's sprayed. The only reason he's going a little bit hard on this section of the panel is because at some point during the work here, the wiper linkage fell back inside the scuttle and in my efforts to fish it out, I got some grubby fingerprints onto the panel, so we're just making sure that it's very clean. Now, those little areas of exposed metalwork, well, what he's gonna do here is he's gonna hit them with a rattle can of etch primer. Now, I already said that a rattle can of etch primer isn't true etch primer, and that's true, but for a very small localized area like this, it's not going to be a problem. 
So these are little metal panels, these color check panels. And what Gar is going to do is he's going to spray his mixed paint across all of them. Then he's going to compare it to the color of the car. So this is the first mix going on to all five of them because you reference one off the next then if you do have to do multiple tweaks to the paint. And again, he's using both the spray gun and then the blower to just blow air across these panels to dry them quicker. So then he exposes that piece of polished rear quarter as his reference area and offers up his first paint mix. And here he is hitting it with the daylight torch and it's just a little bit dark. Now he explained here, you never hold a test panel like this directly against the paint that you're testing it against. It just messes with your eye. You're better off having it slightly removed from the original color to get a good sense of where you are. Now he just nipped off and I don't know what he did. He made a little tweak. He added a little bit of one color or another and he came back and he sprayed the second panel. And when he tested it, he said it wasn't quite right. And as both a video producer and a guy who wanted to be an artist, I kind of like to think I've got a good eye for these things, but I can't see much difference in this. It's incredibly good. You see it here against the first panel and you can see the difference, but look at this, even when you have it up against, it just looks identical. This looks identical to me. But Gar was happy enough. And with a final rub, just to make sure we hadn't missed anything with a tack cloth, he hit it with the color. Again, throughout this, I have to grade all of this footage, which means I have to try and ensure that the color of each scene is an accurate representation of the actual color in real life. And it's a tricky thing to do, especially when you're not back in the environment. So all of these shots, they're an approximation of what this looked like to the naked eye. So Gar hit the car with a couple of coats of colour and then a couple of coats of lacquer or top coat. And before we turned the heat up on the spray booth to cure the paint fully, after it had tacked off slightly, we removed the main areas of masking just so that they'd release easily and then we left the car to cure. And I was so excited, it just looks so good. And although we still had to do the sill at this point, this just felt like the end of the job. It felt like such a win for me. We packed up, we filled the workshop full of all the cars that were currently being worked on at Delta Auto Body. And late that evening, we finally got to go home. I was so excited the next morning to come in and see the job. It felt so good. I never actually thought I'd get to this point with this job. There was a stage that it just seemed like I'd bitten off way more than I could chew. And really, Gar came to the rescue on this one. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for that because this is just a way better job than I ever could have hoped to have gotten. And you know what? If you're looking closely, you're going to see a blemish on the near side of the scuttle. And there's one in almost an identical spot on the offside, there are two little blips of dust or fish eyes or something, and normally they would be nibbed out. It's, it's just a process where you kind of sand them out very finely and then polish the panel, and, and they may as well never have been there, but they are such a small concession to such an amazing job. And like I say, can totally be rectified, but just look at the sheen on this finish. This isn't polished, this isn't corrected afterwards or cut back or anything flatted, anything like that which just harks back to what I was saying about how orange peel obviously happens from the primer coat not being flatted back, not the top coat. And yet, like I say, you could start flattening this, polishing it, correcting it, all that kind of thing, and it will become better and better. But on a car of this age that didn't have this good a paint job in the first place, why would you? I mean, look at the bonnet. Sun damaged and faded and all as this is, you can see the orange peel in it. By the way, I did clay bar this bonnet in preparation for polishing it, but never actually got round to polishing it. There was lots of little bits and pieces of kind of weld spatter and just grime and dirt that had accumulated on the bonnet and the wings, and I got rid of all of those. And that, as I say, is that.
To my patrons, Gary MacDonald, Rupert McLean, Richard Ellis, Lee Benton, Philip Egan, John Smith, Bruce McKay and Tim J. Mull. Thank you, gents. Sincerely thank you. These are the guys who are keeping it going and the patrons really are my producers. That's the way I see them. I, we chat behind the scenes. I take their kind of perspective on things and that gives me a real clue as to what's going on and how I'm doing. But also, in a very real way, they're the producers in the sense that they are bringing the money. They find the money to make soup. That is where the meagre budget that Soup has comes from, solely now with no, no financial sponsor. So if you think you could help out in that way, we'd love to have you on board and I'll see you behind the scenes on Patreon. That's it, episode 32 is done. Sometime in the next few days, this thing's making a move. I will be doing a couple of days a week on this and really focusing on the Range Rover. The Sprinter project is going to become very, very interesting. And on top of that, this weekend coming, I'm going to Spa to check out that, to see what it's like to go to one of the international racing circuits. So I'll see you very soon in another episode, and until then, good luck. <laughs>